Right. Well, welcome everybody. Good to have you here. Three weeks from today, we are there. So I hope you are getting excited. I'm Pastor Paul Bolgren. Uh, Paul is fine. We're on the trip. I just a personal announcement. My wife Karen was supposed to go with us on the trip, but our daughter Hannah was diagnosed with breast cancer a couple of months ago, and she's in the middle of chemo. And Karen, being the perfect mother, yes. has said, "I'll stay home." So uh, you get me. Unfortunately, you don't get Karen, which is too bad. She's delightful. She's delightful, right? Yeah. So uh, delightful. So I am under orders to not have any fun. Uh, and I, I cannot eat lunch and because that's not paid for and I have $20 of spending money for the trip which is a gift for her. so your job is to keep me in line with what I'm going to make sure I do but it's nice to welcome you uh, I'm going to take about a half an hour just to, to show you some pictures of some of the places we're going to see on the second half of our trip before we turn it over to Chris and Gail for the all the nuts and bolts kind of stuff but let me start with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come closer and closer to our trip to the Holy Land, we thank you for this opportunity to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, to see the sights of the Old and New Testament. We pray that this trip will be a blessing to us as individuals and to a group that will be blessings for our congregation when we return, and that you may lift us up, you may inspire us, you may open our eyes, and you may make the scriptures come alive in new and wonderful ways. So bless us on our journey, keep us safe, help us to truly come together as a group, people who don't know each other very well, friends, and bless everyone we leave behind, be with them during our absence. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So I'm going to take you very briefly through uh, the second half yeah, of our trip, the last meeting I talked about. We what we the first half. So uh, Chris is going to be, I'm going to say next, and so he's going to get next. So next. Yeah. <laughs> I'm muting people. All right. Very good. As I started out my previous one, Israel is really, really small. It's important to remember um, the <laughs> distance from the southern part from Jerusalem to Galilee is the distance from Milwaukee to Green Bay. Okay. At its widest, it's the distance from where we are here to Madison. It's a very small country and we'll, we'll cover it very, very quickly. Okay. So as we head south, we're going to start up in Galilee. And as we head south out of Galilee, down the Jordan Valley, we're going to stop at a place called Beit She'an, uh, which is the largest archaeological site in Israel. And what's fascinating about Beit She'an is it was occupied from Canaanite times, that's the part, the upper part here, down through Byzantine times. Have the next one. Uh, and uh, it's a huge, huge site. I remember there in 1993 and they were excavating. I imagine they'll still be excavating today. Next one, please. And uh, what's interesting about Beit Sheyan is it was a Byzantine city that was destroyed by an earthquake in 743 AD. And everything just fell down and the city was abandoned. So when you see it, you will see what's left standing. It's the next one. And then what is what fell and what has been reconstructed. So it's an area that encompasses you know, Canaanite, Israel, uh, Byzantine, uh, Roman, Islamic, the whole gamut of archaeology. That's why it's such a fascinating. I was an ancient history major, so I love this kind of stuff. All right. Then we're going to travel down the Jordan River. And again, the next one, please. Jordan River, do not think the Mississippi. Okay. I live in Grafton. I live across the street from the Milwaukee River. You can throw a rock across it. That's the Jordan River. But the Jordan River is the, the only main river in, in Israel. And it flows from the Sea of Galilee, which is the major source of fresh water down to the Dead Sea, which we'll talk about a little later. And the, the Jordan River is famous because of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, his ministry took place in the Jordan River. There are two popular spots for his ministry. One is at the southern end of the Sea of Galilee. And probably though, it happened more down here, uh, down in the desert area. And we will stop at this spot, which is the traditional site of John the Baptist's ministry. Uh, and on this side is the Israeli side. On the other side is the Jordanian side. So you'll see Israeli soldiers on one side, Jordanian soldiers on the other. Many groups come here for rebaptisms, or people come here for their baptisms as well. So we'll have a chance to stop there. Okay. And then we're going to travel through the wilderness. And you'll get a good, good glimpse, a good understanding of what the starkness of this society, of this, uh, this uh, geological 
geography is when we drive through these areas. This is the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, which is most famous, next one please, for the story of the Good Samaritan, which starts, you know, there was a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho, walking through this God-forsaken desert area when he was set upon and beaten up. And that's where Jesus based his wonderful story. Jesus traveled this road at the end of his ministry. Luke's gospel tells us he came to Jericho, that's where he met Zacchaeus, and from Jericho he traveled to Jerusalem where he died. So again, this will be a spot where Jesus himself traveled. We will go to the Dead Sea, and which is the lowest spot on earth, it's 1,250 feet below sea level. And it also, the Dead Sea is also the saltiest water in, in the world. I believe it's 12 times as salty as the oceans. Uh, if any of you are brave enough to go in the water, because we actually are going to stay down there, uh, you, you, you cannot drown in the Dead Sea. You can just look. I would not be going in it because on my first trip, I put my feet in it and I had red feet for the rest of the day. But some of you who do not have my delicate disposition and fear <laughs> complexion, you will be just fine and have a wonderful, wonderful time. And this I'm is going in. He's going in. He's going in. Just don't get any water in your eyes. Yeah. That happened to me. That was okay. Uh, the Dead Sea is shrinking. It's been shrinking for the last couple of decades uh, as irrigation further north siphons more and more water off the Jordan River. But it's still it's still a remarkable spot. Very rich in minerals. Uh, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah takes place along the Dead Sea, where all of the, the fire, the the the, uh, Brian, the brimstone and bitumen come down flaming from heaven because this is a very oil rich area. And uh, but it's in the middle of nowhere. But where we will be, it is will be tourist heaven. So okay, next one. That's also where they'll have Ahava, where you can buy your Dead Sea salts and uh, creams. <laughs> and my wife. Great and, gifts for Christmas. That's probably. right. That's where I'm spending my $20 spending money. Fun, so. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, again, this is the, the Judean wilderness. All right. This stark area. There's a, there's a verse in Amos, Amos chapter 5, which I'll point out when we're there. Uh, where Amos says, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness looks like an ever flowing stream. And the image of that, again, is not a river of the Fox River here in town. It's these dry hillsides where in Israel, when they get the rain and it comes in torrents, the water comes rushing down these hillsides. And so the image of Amos, let justice roll down like waters, is the water just rushing down the hillsides after the flood. And that was one of the things that struck me my first trip there, bringing the scriptures alive. We hope there are a lot of things that will bring the scriptures alive too. We will stop at Qumran, which was a settlement, uh, we think, there's a lot of controversy over Qumran, uh, founded by a group called the Essenes from about roughly 80 BC to about 70 AD. We, we think it was a communal ascetic community living out here in the wilderness and uh, Jewish, Jewish, and what they're most famous for is copying the scriptures. Next one, please. Uh, and that's where the Dead Sea Scrolls come from. This community were dedicated to the scriptures. And when the Romans came during the Jewish Roman War of 66 to 70 AD, you'll hear a lot about that on the trip, uh, the Essenes, they hid their scrolls, which were their most valuable possessions. Next one, please. And these scrolls were discovered beginning in 1947. There's a wonderful story of a Bedouin boy who was looking for a lost sheep. And he came to one of those caves. Can you go back one? One of these caves, this is a cave you can see right from Qumran. He threw a rock into the cave to see if the sheep were in there and he heard breaking pottery. And he went in and explored and that's where they found these scrolls. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls range from an almost complete copy of the book of Isaiah to tiny little fragments that have one or two letters. Go to the next one. And that's the Isaiah Scroll, which is in the museum in Jerusalem. Uh, and so scholars since 1947 have been examining these documents, putting them together. There are parts of every book of the Old Testament except the book of Esther. And the speculation is there's not Esther because the book of Esther doesn't mention God. And so, or maybe it's there, we just haven't found it yet. Uh, and tiny bits and pieces continue to be found as uh, the Israeli government and other archaeological teams have had numerous expeditions throughout the decades trying to find more of the Dead Sea. So we will get to go see what that is. Now there's a huge shopping mart 
right there on the site. So it's not quite like what it was like. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to Masada, which is one of the most historically gripping places on earth. Masada originally, it is a, a mountain that stands separate by itself, just comes up out of the ground. And King Herod the Great, I think, built one of his, his palaces there. Herod, this is the Herod of the birth of Jesus, Herod, not the Herod of Jesus' death. Uh, and he built for himself numerous palaces. He built one here in the Judea wilderness for his winter getaway uh, because it was cooler and the breezes would come. And so he had this magnificent palace here, uh, including he had, he had uh, a steam bath, he had hot and cold water, he had all kinds of stuff. But during the Jewish-Roman War, 66 to 70, which you'll hear a lot about, Masada was occupied by a group of about a thousand zealots, Jewish rebels, who held out against the Romans until the year 74 AD. When we go there, um, we get to take a cable car. Uh, because next one, please. Because otherwise, this is how you got up in ancient times. You would walk this zigzag path. So you can see in 70 AD, the Jews are here and the Romans came and laid siege. If I can have the next one. Uh, the Romans came and laid siege to, to Masada. It was the last holdout in the war. Jerusalem fell in the year 70, but the Jews at Masada held out for another three to four years. The Romans, uh, they built, and you'll see this, they built this ramp. This is artificial. The Romans used slaves to build this ramp up to the top where they could storm it. And while the Romans are building it, the Jews are on top throwing rocks and everything down on top of them. And as the story goes, the day of, uh, next week, and if, when you're on the top of Masada, you can look down and you can still see the outlines of the Roman forts. That's one of the Roman forts they built. And they built a 12 mile wall, 12 mile long wall around Masada to keep anyone from getting in or getting out. And today you can still see the outlines of the Roman forts and much of the wall. The night before the Romans were to assault Masada and the Jews knew they were doomed. Uh, according to the Jewish historian Josephus, who was not there, but who tells the story, the Jews decided that they would rather commit suicide than be taken slaves as the Roman, from the Romans. And so what they did, next one please, is they drew lots. They wrote their names down, the men wrote their names down, and they drew lots, and they took turns slaughtering their families and each other. And uh, archaeologists actually found these on Masada when it was excavated in the early 1960s, including, next one, please. Uh, this one, Ben Yair, who was the, the leader of the uh, zealots. And so when the Romans stormed the, the hilltop the next day, they met no opposition, and they found all but a handful of the Jews dead. There were a couple of women and children who did in the cave. But of the rest of the Jews, they, they decided, I would rather die free than live as a Roman slave. In fact, I'm not sure if the Israeli army still does it today, the Israeli military, but when officers took their oath, they would go to Masada and they would take, they would take an oath never again following the Holocaust, that never again will Jews fall victim to military forces attacking them. And so Masada is a powerful, powerful site. It's a stark archeological site. It's just amazing vistas. But when you, when you hear the story, and I'm going to bring along uh, Josephus, and I'm going to read the story to you of what, what, how Josephus tells the story of the son. Okay, quick question. Anyone have questions up on that? So I stop talking because I have a habit of talking on that. <laughs> and on, the, on our trip, uh, we'll take time probably almost every night just to get together and chat, you to ask questions. I'll talk about what we experienced that day. So if you have questions here today, right now. All right. From Masada, we will also go to Bethlehem, which is the birthplace of Jesus. Scenic Bethlehem, when you get to Bethlehem, you will see something different, though. Uh, Bethlehem, back is the next one. Bethlehem is controlled by the Palestinian Authority, and the Israeli government has built a wall around Bethlehem. There are several areas in Israel where, where Israel has built a wall to keep terrorists out. And so it's, it's a shock contrast when you saw it the first time, driving into this birthplace of our savior, angels and Mary and all that other one sweetness, you see this wall surrounding it. But they were going to visit the church of the uh, nativity, which is the traditional birth spot of Jesus. Now, of course, we don't know exactly where Jesus was born, 
But this church is one of the oldest churches still in existence and still used in the world. It was built in the fourth century AD by the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, who's the emperor who legalized Christianity. And it is a fascinating building. Uh, it has been built and expanded over and over. It's been destroyed and rebuilt, but it, it goes back to the fourth century. That's the next one. And when you enter, you'll find when you enter, you go through, I think most tourists go through this little door where you have to bend over. Because then you end the church bowing. You enter the church bowing because of the reverence of the site. So keep that in mind when we when we go there. And inside is this beautiful, beautiful. This church dates to the sixth century because the original church was destroyed. But part of it has survived. On the floor down here, you can see these open spots down there. Those are back to the next one. Those are uh, here's what it looked like a century plus ago. Uh, those are mosaics constructed during the time of Constantine the Great when he built the first church here. And he's the emperor who in 313 legalized Christianity and he built churches. The original St. Peter's in Rome was built by Constantine the Great in the early fourth century. And so the next one, please. You can see these mosaics. So when you see those mosaics, um, you know, St. John's last building project was in 1999, all right? My church, Grace and Grafton, we built a building project in 2016. This is the building project from 345 AD. <laughs> so when, you, when you're in here, you are in, it might be the oldest active church in the world. And that's what you want to keep in mind. Next one, please. And when you go down, you go down these little stairs. And as you go down the stairs, you'll come into this little, this little tiny room. Um, and this silver star symbolizes the place where Jesus was born. This was the cave. They laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the Now Again, we don't know if this is the exact spot, but early Christian tradition says this is. When we were there last time, to show you how old this church is. <clears throat> now, we don't like graffiti. Uh, we don't like people writing on our walls today, but graffiti has been around forever. And when you go down, when you're waiting to go down the steps, there are pillars on either side. And look on them, and you will see crosses that were scratched into the stone by crusaders almost 900 years ago, because they were tourists. They were pilgrims coming to see this site. This church was already 500, 600 years old when they came during the crusade. That gives you an idea of how old you're talking about. Uh, Israel has its issues, and it's not just between the Jews and the Palestinians. But this church in the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem is controlled by several different Christian uh, religious groups. And in 2011, they got into a broom wielding fight. These are different groups of priests who are fighting each other over who got to clean the church. Now, next church cleanup day, yeah. keep that in mind when we have members fighting them. No, I want to do the bathrooms. Okay. Yeah. Christians are not perfect, and those who are in control of these religious sites are not necessarily perfect. But that's just an interesting, interesting side. And actually, the Palestinians had the Palestinian police had to come in and break up the Christians who were fighting each other. <laughs> All right. And then we're going to go to Jerusalem, or we'll spend several days. The, the most amazing city in the world, in my humble opinion. And when we come to Jerusalem, there's some things you need to understand. If you've been to Egypt, this is Karnak Luxor. You're used to seeing all the stuff still standing there. Next one. You've been to Rome. That's the forum. All these things still standing there. I mean, the Senate building from the second century, uh, the church, the, the, the shrine, the temple built to uh, Antoninus Pius in the second century. That's what we're used to seeing in some of these ancient cities. You will not see that in Jerusalem because Jerusalem has been built and destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed many times through the centuries. So you won't see what was there in the past, the distant past, except for certain little spots. So to give you an idea, Jerusalem was first controlled by the Canaanites. Dates back to about 2000 BC. Later, the Egyptians controlled the Canaanites. When the time of King David, Jerusalem was controlled by a group called the Jebusites. David conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites. And then King Solomon built his first temple on this. And originally, Jerusalem had uh, two, two valleys that run by them, okay, over here and over here. This is the Tyropian. This one has been closed in, covered up. 
This one still is here. So that was the that's the uh, Old Testament. That's the Jerusalem of most of the Old Testament. And then in 587 BC, that Jerusalem and the Solomon's Temple were burned to the ground by the Babylonians. Next one, please. And then it was rebuilt after the Jews came back from captivity in Babylon uh, in a small, very modest temple. And then shortly before the birth of Jesus, King Herod the Great built a new temple. And that's the temple in the New Testament, Herod's temple, which was actually, uh, next one, please. When this temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans, they weren't even done building it yet. It had been built in the process being built for over 100 years when the Romans came and destroyed it. And the Romans' destruction of Jerusalem was such a huge event in Roman history that this is, this is the, uh, the victory arch of Titus in the Roman Forum. And what he chose to put on this, because he, he was the son of the general Vespasian who headed up the war against the Jews, and Titus himself, when his dad became emperor, finished up the war. He conquered Jerusalem. It was so important that he, on his victory arch in Rome, engraved scenes of the loot, that's the menorah from the temple, that were taken off. In fact, it's believed that the Roman Colosseum in Rome was built, funded by all the loot that was taken from the temple in Jerusalem. And so, again, Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt. It was uh, rebuilt again during Byzantine time. This is a beautiful a beautiful floor mosaic of what Jerusalem looked like about 700, 800 AD up here in, in, in Greek. It says the holy city Jerusalem. I took Greek 40 years ago. Pretty impressed, aren't you? Uh, but it continues. Uh, it was the Crusaders came and, uh, and they added to what they did. Before the Crusaders, when Jerusalem fell to the, to the uh, forces of the Persia, Islamic forces, they built the magnificent Dome of the Rock which still stands today. That dates from the seventh century AD. Again, destruction, rebuilding, destruction, rebuilding. It continued until the Six Day War in 1967. Before the Six Day War, Jerusalem was controlled most of it by the Jordanian government. The Israelis conquered Jerusalem in the 1967 war. And next one, please. And when we go to the Wailing Wall, and here's the Wailing Wall right here, but before the 1967 war, this was all uh, a neighborhood. Which, next one, please. The Israeli government tore down. They tore down all those houses. So you can today have this. And that's what you'll see. So when you go to the Wailing Wall, and the Wailing Wall, this is one of the few remaining spots of the Second Temple. These are the King Herod the Great, when he built the Second Temple, he built a retaining wall to make the, the artificial hillside larger. And today, devout Jews will come and they will pray here. And you will see them praying here. They will not go up on the, on the Temple Mount because devout Jews are afraid they may accidentally step where the Holy of Holies was. So you will see devout Jews praying down there, spot for the men, the spot for the women, and you'll see them sticking sheets of paper, prayer requests, in the walls of the wind wall. So again, Jerusalem, built, destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed. So you'll see a lot of different things. This is destruction from the Romans in 70 AD. And the Israeli uh, government has done massive archaeological excavations, and you'll get to see where those were. When the Romans destroyed it, they just threw all the rubble from top of the Temple Mount down below. And that's all been cleaned up. Some of it's been left. Uh, these were market stalls, and they left a couple areas where they're still covered up. You'll get to see that as well. Uh, some of the things they found in these excavations, they found this uh, engraved marble. In Hebrew, it says, to the place of the trumpeting. And this stood on one of the upper walls of the temple. And that's where the priest would blow the trumpets when it was time to come and pray. It's just a wonderful glimpse of history. Next one. Uh, again, you'll get to see all the different levels of archaeology. You can see how far down it goes. Each level, a different, a different era of history. And it's just, it's just fascinating. If you want to walk where Jesus walked, and if we have an opportunity, when we go to the, this is the south end of the Temple Mount. There are these steps here. This is one of the highlights of my first trip there. Uh, those steps were there when Jesus was alive. And when Jesus came to Jerusalem, he would have walked up those steps. The next one will show you there. Okay. This is what it looked like. There, there are a couple of gates which are now closed up, and pilgrims would come in here. So if we have an opportunity to go to this place, it's called the Old Vale, from the southern end of the Temple Mount. A um, couple of times we'll be able to say, you know what, Jesus was here. And that's one of the places where we'll be able to say, Jesus was here. And, you know, that's really amazing. Next one. 
Other places we'll see south of the Temple Mount, there have been excavations going on for the last 50, 60 years at a place called the Milo. And it is thought that this is where King David and the kings of uh, Israel and Judah had their palace. And there's been some fascinating archaeological digs. And I have not seen any of those in person. I'm hoping we have an opportunity to go there. This is a huge artificial retaining wall that was built uh, to support the palaces and the, and the rooms of the houses of some of the upper crust in Judean and Israelite society. Also, the Israeli government has built this huge tunnel. If you're not claustrophobic, this is a really cool place to go. This huge tunnel that runs along the length of the Western Wall. And you can go down here and see these huge stones, some of them weighing hundreds of tons, that were part of the foundation of the Western Wall of the temple, just to show you, you know, everything that's being done and excavated. And this is what we see today. The, the Dome of the Rock, on the Temple Mount, the Kidron Valley, and over here, this is the Garden of Gethsemane. The beautiful church there and the church there. The Garden of Gethsemane is where Jesus prayed. You go to the next one, where Jesus prayed. Uh, the Via della Rosa is, we'll walk the Via della Rosa, the Way of Sorrows, which is the traditional path where Jesus walked on his way to the cross. The next one. Again, uh, it's very popular for Catholic pilgrims when they stop and they pray at each, at each step. I don't think we're going to do that, but you have something you might want to show them at one. Of the stops. We talked about that yesterday. Shh, shh, it's a surprise. Okay, next one. Uh, we'll see this Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the traditional spot, not traditional, probably the actual spot where Jesus was crucified and was buried. And it is now a whole complex of churches, again, dating back to the time of Constantine the Great in the fourth century. This is called the Cenotaph. This is the traditional burial spot of Jesus. In fact, the Israeli government just spent millions of dollars restoring that. Uh, and it's, it's a huge freestanding thing underneath a big dome, which makes us think, well, how could this be where Jesus was buried? Because we have to understand how things change. This church now encompasses where Jesus was buried and also Calvary, the spot where Jesus was executed. And when Jesus was buried, this was a limestone quarry. Uh, and originally where the sin cap now stands was a cave. And it's just been through the centuries. You know, you know, I, when I was pastor here 40 years ago, this church looked a lot different than it does today. We've added and taken stuff down and all kinds of things like that. So when you're in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, keep in mind that the, the landscape has been changed through the centuries as the church is built and rebuilt and rebuilt. And again, when you're in here, you will see graffiti people scratching on the wall, going back to the 700s, the 800s AD. That's how long pilgrims have been coming. Again, one of my favorite places. This is a ladder that stands on a ledge over the opening, the entranceway to the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This ladder has been standing there since 1753. And the reason it's been standing there since 1753 is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is uh, governed by six different church bodies. You remember the fighting going on in Bethlehem? They don't always get along. And for anything to be done, everyone has to agree. Well, this ladder was left by a workman in 1753, and the six groups could not agree whether to take it down or not. And so it has stood there since 1753, except in 2011, I think, an Italian tourist stole it. When they found it, they put it back. Okay, <laughs> So you'll see that when we go in. We'll go to the garden tree, which is probably not the burial place of Jesus, but it's what we imagined the burial place of Jesus to be like. It's, it's in a garden in Jerusalem. It has this tomb that you walk in with the, the spot here for the rolling stone. Um, uh, yeah, the next one here. Uh, next to it is, this is actually a bus parking lot, but there is this rock that looks like two eyes and a nose and a mouth because Golgotha is the place of the skull. And the, the uh, late 18th century, 19th century, a Roman general named Gordon looked at that and he said, that looks like Golgotha to me. And, and, so, and there's this tomb right on the other side. That's got to be it. It probably isn't, but it's a beautiful spot. And it gives you a feel for what it was like. And we'll probably have a communion service there because it's a wonderful place. A couple more. Again, this is the Temple Mount, as we will see it, looking from the Kidron Valley west, standing on the Mount of Olives, or Mount of Olives, which is where the Garden of Gethsemane is. That's an overview. The Dome of the Rock, that's the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Down here are 
or the steps that I talked about that Jesus would have walked up. Again, centuries upon centuries upon centuries. And there are graves all along here because devout Jews believe when the Messiah comes, he will come to Jerusalem and they want to be where he is. So there are graves all along the Kidron Bell. Again, another beautiful view of the Dome of the Rock. The, uh, the King of Jordan paid for the gold. That's actual gold. That's not paid. That's gold. Cool. Okay. And if we're lucky enough to get into the Dome of the Rock, uh, many scholars believe this is where Solomon's temple stood. And on, on to the next one, if it has, no, go back one. This is what's inside. It's just this bare rock. This is the rock which Muslims believe Muhammad rode his horse into heaven when he ascended into heaven. This is where the Jews believe Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. But there's a, a brilliant scholar named Lynn Rittmeyer who looked at here, and somewhere in here, and I can't really pick it out from this picture, but there is a little rectangular area carved out of the bedrock. And he, he's a really smart guy, and he, and he realized it is the exact size of the Ark of the Covenant. And he speculates, speculates that that is where the Ark of the Covenant sat. And so the, in, the interior of the Holy of Holies in the temple was not some beautiful room with this marble floor. It was this bare rock. Um, so I hope we can get in there depending upon the time of day and prayer services. Uh, but hope, again, bringing the scriptures alive. And then the Mount of Olives is the cross. We'll go to the Mount of Olives. Quit. Uh, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane in, in uh, Hebrew means olive crescent. It's filled with olive trees. Some of these olive trees may actually date back to the time of Jesus. That's how old they are. And so we'll be able to go over there. It's a couple of beautiful churches. It's from the Mount of Olives that Jesus rode in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. We'll be able to walk down that way. And you will have time for shopping. Lots of shopping. You will have time for lots of food. Next one. And then finally, on our last day, we're going to go to Caesarea Maritima, which was a city built on the Mediterranean Sea by King Herod the Great. This is the Hippodrome. It's the racetrack, which when we were there in first in 1983, they hadn't uncovered that yet. But they've uncovered that, so you can see the Hippodrome. Uh, you can see uh, Herod had a palace here. He had a prison here, and that's where the Apostle Paul was in prison. There was this theater. And when the theater was activated in the 1960s, they found a stone that had been put in secondary use as a floor stone for walking up one of the rows. And on the stone was engraved the name Pontius Pilate. And it's the only historical evidence, archeological evidence to support the existence of Pilate. And so we will get to see uh, Caesarea Maritima as well. And again, uh, King Herod built his palace built an artificial harbor, uh, and the Apostle Paul was in prison there for two and a half years before he was sent off to Rome to face his judgment for Emperor Nero. And this is uh, the remnants of that palace. It had an indoor swimming pool, because when you're the king, you can do whatever you want. So you can still see the, re the remnants of King Herod's swimming pool there as well. And you'll also see the aqueduct, which runs 14 miles from Mount Hermon, down, the, down along the sea, which brought fresh water from Mount Hermon all the way down to Caesarea Maritima. And there's a section of this aqueduct that's really cool to see and gives you a real impression of how good they were archaeology or building things. So that is our trip. And in a couple weeks, you don't have to look at pictures anymore. In a couple weeks, you get to go like that yourselves. And I hope you will enjoy everything you see and that you'll learn more. And get any questions you have, please save them up into the day. We'll get together, you can have a drink, you can relax, you can ask questions, we'll talk about what we experienced and, and what it meant for us today. So I'm very thankful that you had the opportunity to join us on that. So that is my part of the evening. Anyone have a question? I went five to minutes, but <laughs> okay, I'm sure you will have later. But thank you, appreciate that. I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> So um, thanks, Paul. Paul. Paul's got all the knowledge. That's why he brought him along, right? Of course, our our tour guides will have a few uh, pieces of information as well. But um, we did include for you a couple of, like uh, informational pieces to have with. Um, are you going to be covering this, or should I go over this? You know, are you going to cover this, or do you want me to go over this? No, you cover. Okay. So first of all, uh, we gave you the itinerary. 
Um, I'll put this up online too. We'll send it out as well. You can have it electronically if you want it. Um, we, one, and Paul kind of walked through a lot of this that you'll see, especially in the Jerusalem section, once we start going from the north, going down into the south. Um, but so this gives you the, the itinerary of the day, but also we try to give you some scriptural references so you kind of know what's going on in the Bible in different places. Um, recognize that um, these things change a little bit. Okay, that's really important because as we get into the day and or the week and we're there, suddenly something might happen and uh, Yair might say, you know what, we're going to adjust a little bit because of this. If we, if we do this, we'll be able to do this, you know. So they're the ones that really know the schedule and know what's going on. So we're following them. But it gives you a rough estimate of what's going on, how things are going to work. Every day before uh, we uh, finish today, Yair will say, okay, here's tomorrow. This is what the plan is. This is what we're going to do. Here's what you should wear, right? Um, all the things that you should uh, be thinking about. So he'll give us all of that and that's what time breakfast is and be ready to go and all those good things. So so this gives you uh, this gives you just a really rough itinerary, but it gives you a sense of what's going on and where, where we're going to be each day, you know, okay? Any questions on, on this? So, all right? Just be flexible. Flexible, yeah, Mark. I think I told you Mark before, right? Maximum absolute rigid flexibility. <laughs> That's really important to have a good time. And we're gonna have a great time all the way along. So um, that's that's kind of an important part of this trip, making sure everybody's doing well. I would say also, if you're not doing well, for whatever reason, um, something didn't agree with you, you're having a hard time, uh, make sure you tell us, okay? We don't want you suffering through. Uh, one of my famous uh, family stories was my cousin, who uh, in his teens, when he went on a mission trip with the youth group, um, punctured a lung. And didn't tell anybody for like a week. So don't do that. All right. <laughs> That's a great example of what not to do. So if you're not feeling well, tell us. You know, we can we can help with that. We uh, we might be able to help with that. <laughs> um, but we'll you know we'll make sure you're you're taking care. It's really important to be thinking about how is everybody doing. We want everybody to have a good time. If you if you're feeling really taxed, um, we had another great story of something that we kind of pushed a little too hard on and heard about it afterwards, you know? Um, if you're feeling like, you know, I need I need a little time here, I need a break. It's okay to say that. And it might be the kind of thing, you know, I think I just want to sit on the bottom, <laughs> right? And even though I'm in this wonderful country and I should keep going, you know, if I keep pushing myself, it might be too much. So listen to your body, make sure you tell us if you're not doing well. We really want you to have a great trip and be doing well, okay? So those are really important things, right? Anything? Either of you want to say about that as well? Do you have that flexibility? Yes. Or do you have that flexibility? I think the whisper system is going to make it nice for everyone. If you see a pathway that you're like, hmm, pretty rocky, or I, I just, uh, my knee hurts, or something like that, we have the whisper system and you will be able to hear I hear all the time. Yes. Unless you're, you know, two miles away. But so what that means is um, he's got a transmitter. And we will all have little head, headsets that receive him. The uh, first time I did this trip, you, you really had to kind of be leaning in and trying to hear him the whole time, which was hard because we won't be the only group in Jerusalem, believe, believe it or not, right? <laughs> and, um, and, you know, often, especially when he gets like a holy sepulcher or something really big, you know, suddenly 20 groups are descending on at the same time. And so trying to hear your tour guide I think that's actually how we ended up with Yair, right? Because you heard Yair and you're like, I want to go with him. Uh, <laughs> a different tour guide. Um, so, uh, but the whisper system, uh, he will transmit, he's got a microphone right underneath for himself and then we'll be able to hear him. So you can, he can be 50 feet ahead of us and you can still hear. Now I would say stick with the group, all right? Because it's really easy to get lost. And, um, they do have these god awful red hats that nobody likes to wear, right? But it does help for everybody to see each other. So there might be these times, I don't know if they're giving us the red hats. I think they probably will. Because I think they bought them like 30 years ago and they've got like, they've got like 60,000 of them still to get out. But um, so it might be the kind of thing where we don't wear it all the time, but it's like, okay, we're getting into a sea of people that's put on our hats just to make sure. 
Um, you'll see a lot of groups with the, with the little flag, you know, follow the flag, that kind of thing. So, but it is really important to, to stay together in these kind of times because it is, it's easy to get lost. We might, um, might also try to have a buddy system, uh, be thinking about, and, and I would, the way I've done it with youth groups is I had groups of like six so that um, instead of counting off on the bus, you know, going 33 people, one, two, it goes really slow. Say group A, good, group B, good, group C, good, group, okay, we got our group, let's go. And so if you're looking at, yeah, we got our six, we're good. You know, that kind of thing helps. Um, so, but then you're watching out for each other the whole way along. Where if, if we're getting busy, we might just stop and say, group check, everybody good? Okay, let's keep moving. All right, so those kind of things are really important as we go. It's we don't want to lose anybody. Haven't lost anybody yet, and we don't want to start this trip either. Um, you do also have the sheet. These are a lot of a uh, lot of little details that you big details too that you need to know, such as like the airline uh, schedule. So that's all on here as well. I did put it on the itinerary as well, so you see it there, but. This also has um, all of our hotels. So if you did want to go and check them out ahead of time, the websites are there. Um, so the Ramada Nazareth, that's our first hotel, will be there I think three nights. Um, then we head south, um, like we just talked about, going down River Jordan all the way to the Dead Sea. Um, I'm really excited about being at the Dead Sea. I like to go in. It's, it's, it's one of these experiences that's just unreal to actually float the, the famous picture of people holding a newspaper above the water, just floating. Um, it is extremely salty though. If, you're, if your skin is really sensitive, you'll, you'll tell, um, your, your skin will react to it. Um, but it is an experience. It's definitely a really interesting experience. Really neat uh, for us. I've never done this before. We get to be at a hotel that's overnight there. So we're not rushing out. You know, we get to stay there. Uh, I'm sure it's a spa, so I'm sure they're going to have a pool inside too. If you want to swim inside and go clean off and things like that, so that's going to be nice. And then in Jerusalem, the St. George. Okay, so it's, those are a couple of key things if you want to check it out. The last one's um, the symbol. The last one's this symbol. Yeah. Um, uh, realizing that uh, are they eight or seven hours? It says eight here. It's either seven or eight hours ahead. I'm not sure, but so. Um, so that goes along um, just so your family knows. You know, if they're calling you in, at three in the morning, that might not be a great time to call you, right? Things like that, um, good, good to be aware of. And you can even set your phone if you want on the clock feature. They've got the world times. So you could be watching, you know, what time is it back in Milwaukee or Madison or wherever, just so you can have a sense of where other people are as well. So that's something to note. Um, phones, go ahead. Yeah. eight hours ahead. And uh, yeah, we're not, are we doing well? Eight, in the morning, no, no. Okay, so it's late. Um, I'll transition this time to talk about um, the visas, or do we want to hit that later? No. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't think there's really that much to say, except that you have to be very persistent on the site. Um, the, um, Office, the description office for the visa site um, said exactly that. You need to be persistent. And if if you have trouble here, we can ask Ayer or Amos, his brother, to help us when we get there. Like you can say, well, I'll meet you down in the lobby and I'll see if I can get you through. And if push comes to shove, you'll just have to get it at the airport in Turkey, which we hope doesn't happen. Because the whole group is going to have to wait for that to happen. I, I did mine last night. It took me eight times, and I finally got it through. Yeah. So. Did you get through? I got through. And you got through? I did not. And who has gotten through on the visa site? By the way, if you have, you really just got to sit there for an hour. I got all the way through and then it quit on me. I had to do it all again. So far. Well, I couldn't do it. So he went to Chrome and I went bam. Yeah, and that might be a that might be the other case too if you switch your browser to Chrome or something. Um, we'll also have to do the Israel uh, health form, and I think that's ten days before. It's on ten weekend. Well, that's questionable. 
Okay. So I think they probably, you know, ish. I'm guessing. <laughs> Shoot for 10. That's what I would say. I know. I, I'm not sure the answer there. Okay. So, so we're shooting for the 20th of October. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We'll send out a reminder at that time too. So, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. This is one where to the extent that we put the date we're actually getting in the church here, so we do it a couple days before. You put the date you're getting in, and then they give you. I forget what it is. 90 days. Yeah. Yeah. Put the date you arrive. Yeah. They want to know what your arrival date is. Not the day that we leave. No, last year. Seventeen. Another one is the seventeenth. Yes. Yes. Um, the weather. Uh, you know, again, you want to think about um, having the right kind of clothes with you. Uh, layers is always good. Realize, no matter what, when we go to Masada, it's gonna be hot. It's just, it's just hot. So when you're in Dead Sea, it, you're out in the desert. It is hot out there. So. Um, we're up on the side. It's going to be, it's really warm. That's a great place for um, sunscreen, things like that. Probably if you want to bring uh, um, sunglasses, things like that. It, you're out in the, in the desert. So it's an incredible sight. It's just so incredible to be up there, but, but it's warm. So it's like, why did they make a palace out here? I don't quite understand that, but you know, when you're the king, you get to do crazy things. Um, any questions about packing? Are we good with understanding that? You've got your, yep, go ahead, Terry. So, um, I mean, I don't take like a medication. So I know like you take a medication, you take it in the bottle or that stuff. But what about things like vitamin D or calcium? Like, do you have to like take it in a bottle that has that on it? Or can you just put it in your little pill thing? I think you. You put all yours in your little thing? Okay, got it. I think you'll be okay. They're not, they're not going to be too picky about that. I think the prescription just like would be the most critical, but it's not like we're um, watching in some of us. You know, I would also say um, I've had several times where my luggage didn't come with me. You know, you, I mean, you assume it's going to, and then it doesn't. So the kind of stuff that, and it might be like three days before you get up your stuff. That's happening. It might show up all wet. So, you know, so if I would say, if it's something you have to have, put it in your carry-on. You know, if you need medication, you can't wait for three days. My aunt was just in the hospital because of all that. You know, bring it in your carry-on. Make sure you've got it with you. If it's glasses that you really need, bring it in your carry-on. You know, those kind of things. Think about, you might even want to have just a very simple change of clothes just in case, one change of clothes in there. So, so those kind of things. I'll, mine will be loaded with camera equipment so that I can't move on. Take my camera equipment in your bag. <laughs> so if I'm doing a roll-on and a backpack, I mean, essentially I could carry both of those on anyway, right? Yes. I don't have to check that. Right, right. So yeah, so your carry-on is a typical carry-on suitcase. So, so the small one, yeah. right? And uh, it's got the dimensions, I believe, on here. And you can also go in. It's a standard dimension. Everybody uses the same dimension for carry-on. And then some sort of bag. So that's either a backpack or a purse or you know something like that. We did ask, we were talking earlier about medical devices like a CPAP machine. Um, we assume that's that's all good. No, it's stated It's not assumed. It's, it's, a, it's a written law. So it's, it's, a, it's not counted in your numbers. Just not, it's just something you have to bring. Okay. Yeah. I have a card for my eye doctor that says I can't cataracts. Okay. okay. So I have an interocular lens. Sure. Do I need to have that card with me to prove that I have this? I don't think you'd be stopping for that. I mean, if it's kind of thing that you're going to worry about it until it's bring along, and you're like, if it's not something you can have that hard, you got it. Stephen. So are we saying that if you do take medication, it should come in the bottle with the description of what it is on it, or not? I I would say I don't want to give the wrong. I don't want to give the wrong. But 
I right. tried it both ways where if we had a pill box that we had each day, and if they scan that, they know you're taking medication. But we've never been stuck, but I've done it both. I've taken the actual. Has anybody have ever been stuck? We don't have like a little card. You don't, you just bring your yeah. little daily. Oh, so. Yeah, yeah. Don't mind it. I don't think it's going to be the kind of thing. That people will be really worried about. Yeah. If the drug dog stops at your bag, that's when they want to talk. You know, that's when they want to talk. Yeah. yeah. Don't they sit. Yeah. Yeah. Don't keep moving. <laughs> it's, it's because of sausage in your body, right? Um, I, I didn't even mention this. Yeah. I mean, health health form. They mm -hmm. ask for your flight number. Mm -hmm. I have, I have, it is on the sheet that you have. TK TK is Turkish Air. And it is also on your ticket. Yeah, and if you look at the ticket, it actually is the four digit code. I did just have a zero before all this. That's all they're doing. So, so yeah. Did everybody see your electronic tickets? It came in your email. Anybody not see it? Yeah, what do we do? Because there's no like scan bar thing. Uh, we have to get when we when we check in, you'll get your check in. Uh, we'll show up there, and they'll give you your. You'll, they'll either give you. Yeah, they'll give you a boarding pass there. Oh, so we just give them the number. You just say yeah, and they'll look you up. You show them your passport. Everybody has to have your passport, right? That's kind of important. So you show your passport, and then they'll give you your boarding passes, and they'll give it to you for the first flight and the the uh, connecting flight. We need nothing from Turkish Air to the past. No, or just a piece of paper that we can sign up by Turkish itinerary. Yeah, we'll show up as a group the whole same way and show our passports and we'll give us boarding passes. Well, we have to have No, they just changed that. I think. I think it's off. I think it's off, but when we do that 10 day before is when they'll ask us what's your I think you'll have you will have to put in your vaccination. Uh, I think you have to upload it there. But I'm pretty sure it's you do not have to be that like three thousand. Yeah. You know if they're recommending that latest COVID Well they're pushing it hard, yeah. I mean has anyone had it? Oh. I have. Right, I, know. <laughs> I know they're pushing pneumonia right now, too. Mm -hmm. and something else. Study. Study. Yeah. Study. Check in 24 hours before? Check in at the time you see something like that. I mean, it just says check in, and you know, on a ticket, it says check in. We'll check in. I mean, not an airport. So often when you fly, especially domestic, they'll allow you 24 hours to check in. They'll allow you to do that. And you can do that online yourself on other flights. We're traveling as a group. We will do it all as a group together. So you won't do that online beforehand. Okay. All right. Not, so the 24 hours is being allowed to do it up to 24 hours before most people show up about an hour before a flight or two hours before a flight and check in there we're going to show up i forget what we're showing up about three we're going to show up about three hours before the flight and and do it there okay yeah all right well that was my other question because we're really here at five and we're leaving at 9 40 that if traffic is good that is good that is late at night i think i think okay i think we'll be fine yeah okay I, I just have a question about the shuttle down. Yeah, um, that's a gift. Come, oh, we're coming here at five o'clock. We're going to leave by five, right? Yeah. So my suggestion is is that you arrive here if you are notoriously the kind that slide into the base at the last second. Don't do that. <laughs> um, so my suggestion is, is that you arrive, arrive with no later than 4.30. The bus should be here to load by 4.45. So just give us all peace and if we leave our cars here, we go. The people are coming to Istanbul. We'll get another shuttle from here. 
Are we coming back here? Because yes. we can leave our cars here. Please. You can leave your cars in the back corner. You've got in the back corner of the parking lot. Yeah. 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 yeah, the only difference. I would suggest you would come to this east door. I don't know how many of you came to the east door, the one right outside here. I would suggest you come to the east door with your luggage because the bus will come into that big parking lot. Okay, so don't parking come there. So yeah. Back. Yeah. 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 Now, for those of us who are not taking the shuttle, I'm going to get to O'Hare on my own. Yep. Uh, should I just go to the terminal, check my bag like I would, or should I wait for it? Mm -hmm. You, gonna, I think you can go if you want, if you're there so early that you don't have anything else to do and you want to get up. You can go and check in. Um, but if you want to wait for us, you know, Barb can text you and say, you know, we're mm -hmm. 10 minutes away or okay. we're just getting off the bus or something like that. I mean, you'll know where to go to check in. Yeah. You can just kind of hang. Well, I was just wondering if, like, if all of our luggage is checked at the same time, if that would make it. Not better. really. Okay. Not really. Because they're going to do one at a time. It's going down the conveyor belt. <laughs> so this brings up a point that is really important for us to hear. And that is we are traveling as a group. Okay. So that's really important. So yeah, get in if you want to check in, um, you send your bag in, all that, but then wait there for us. Because if you go onto the gate, we're kind of going, is she here? Or, you know, hopefully you guys are communicating, but maybe you don't have self cell coverage suddenly. And then it's like, we don't know if she's here. And then we're sitting there waiting at the check-in for you, you know, that kind of thing. So it's it is really helpful for us to all kind of be thinking as a group and travel moving as a group, um, which is really frustrating for people that are used to just like traveling and cruising through. So so that is that is the only downside to some of this is you gotta have to handhold each other. And we won't we won't have the leash and we won't have the big rope that we all. But it is really good to do that. I had one experience where um, in El Salvador where. Uh, we were all going through security and somebody left and it was like, did they come through or not? And so suddenly we were stuck. We sent half the group on ahead to check. Sure enough, they were there. Then, you know, it became this whole thing of, and then literally running to get on the plane at the last thing. Okay. So, so you want to try and make sure, I think that's where the pods if we're if we're watching each other, yep, we've got our six, or if we're making that four or six or whatever we're gonna do, that helps with some of that. You know, we're watching each other, we're moving on. Uh, but it is really important to be thinking about the whole group. Okay. So that that is that is a strength and a struggle. So just so we're aware of that. Anything either of you want to say about that? No? It's, it's just important to be on time. That's really yeah, first it's real quick we had a Art and I mean, we're always late. <laughs> and so uh, the way, so it's you know, kind of really important for the sake of the group. Yeah. Oh, I understand the group thing, but once we get to the airport, we should get our we gonna be able to wall using our global entry one that we have. Yeah, and we did, I think a couple of us had that. Um, and that kind of gets you past that line. I think you might still have to kind of just hang out on the other side of the line. Well, right, yeah, it's fine. That kind of thing. But yeah, just so we know, I mean, I think it's Communication is crucial, right? This is what I'm doing. And you tell maybe four or five people. So that's just one person who went, I oh, said something. I don't know what they said. Though, you know? So communicating what's going on, what you're doing, if it's if it's different from the group. So a lot of people know. Okay. But yeah, I know that skipping that huge long line. Hopefully we won't have the huge long line, right? So clarifying those for those of us who are coming back on the Yes. So we we won't leave up. Come and leave a car here because we won't get dropped off here. Right. If you are coming back on the 17th, For these are then only you are going to be a small group. Jim and Dale Mathis are going to be in the small group and they're going to get you all together and you're going to go to the USA coach terminal, get on the bus, and come back. Berkeley Corners will be your drop off point. So you're going to have to have somebody that is ready to come and pick the two of you up. At the, at so the if it makes more sense. It yeah. was just too expensive to get a private shuttle for you. I was just thinking, though, right. that means, like, really, so, it, it would be easier to have someone bring us to church 
on the way out and somebody to come in and set up. So you're saying it doesn't make more sense to park over there and then Okay. On the back side, um, I mean, on the front side, the only other thing I want to mention is make sure you have comfortable shoes. Um, that's always really important. Um, you might want to have two pairs. That's always good too, in case one gets wet or something like that. Um, rain in the back, it, it may happen. So having a light rain jacket and or a poncho or something that you want to wear that way is, isn't a bad idea. Um, money, uh, US dollars is good. Um, again, I think I said this last time, if you are a shopper, um, you'll probably want to have more money. If you're not a shopper, you don't need to worry as much about that. They do take your credit cards though. And with your credit card, as always when you travel, it's always good to call your credit card company. Let them know where you're going to be. They're going to want to know the dates and where exactly you're going to be. So that's really helpful to tell them, all right? Otherwise, you're trying to use it in Jerusalem and it's not working, right? So that's that's really good to do. Cell phone, again, um, call your carrier. Uh, anybody done that yet? Nobody's tried that? So call your carrier and ask them, tell them where you're going to be and what you'd like to do. Um, err on the side of more data than less because it always becomes more than you think it's going to be, right? So um, even if you can do your current plan per day there, that's great. Might cost you a few dollars more, but it's probably going to be worth it. There will be Wi-Fi at the hotels, uh, but then you got to wait till you get back to the hotel to use the Wi-Fi, those kind of things. So if you're if you're that kind of person, that's fine. Um, I think I told the story that my father-in-law wasn't going to pay for the, the digital dial tone, you know, so that's that's just who he is. You know? so, if you want to be that kind of person, that's, that's fine. Um, you shouldn't be worrying about English. It's spoken everywhere. Yair is very understandable. So um, so that'll be all good. You might want to have a swimsuit just for the Dead Sea. Um, that's, that's that example. I think there's a pool at one of the other hotels as well. I forget. St. George does, yeah. Uh, we talked about medication. Electricity, it's the European style plug. So it's just the, the two round um, plugs and if, if you buy the converters, um, you know, there's tons of different styles of converters that either do USB, convert to USB, or at least one uh, English US plug. You know? So probably it's good to have if you have a laptop with you or want to charge your Camera batteries or your cell phone at night. So those are a good thing. Any anyone have questions about that? I think it's US, I think it's called the C adapter, European, EU. So okay. If you have questions, you can shoot me a shoot me an email. I'll send you a picture of what it looks like. Um I don't think it's good to have a few snacks with you. Um we will have a big breakfast, we'll have a big dinner. Um, and lunch is on your own, as we've said. 
Um, we'll have we'll, we'll have places where you can get lunch, but you might just want to, you know, bring whatever kind of comfort food uh, helps you feel comfortable. So maybe if that's if that's gum, if that's uh, almonds, if that's whatever is whatever you like, you might want to have some of that with you. Just a bag of that. Um, there's going to be plenty of places to buy stuff there too. Um, you know, cashews are everywhere, right? Um, so things like that. Any questions about any of that? Any dietary things we need to know? That's you think? Be my Does anybody have? You can talk to us about that if you want. Know about that. Yeah. So if the food is much more of a Mediterranean diet. Um, just so you, just so you're aware, it's delicious. There's going to be lots of things to eat. Like we said, it's a buffet. So if you're picky, you're still going to be able to find stuff. So, um, but it, it is really nice. Would you recommend like bring us pollinators? Because I don't want to hear about this, but I need to know what we're doing yeah. anyway, or um, I can definitely not use all that Right. You could definitely bring it. Um, you'd fill it up in the hotel before you go each day. Uh, I don't think you'll find a place along the way to fill it up during the day, but at least you've got it for for your day. Uh, I don't. I mean, I know people like to run with them. I I don't personally like to carry things with me like that. It's on the camera, but um, so it's up to you how you want to do that. If you just want to have it on the bus, that's fine. They they always have water on the bus for purchase, so they'll have. Um, I think they're. Spend a dollar a bottle. I don't know if that will hold or not. Inflation is made it it like ten dollars a bottle. Not a bottle. <laughs> Probably. So. And what about what about the hotel? Do they have bottled water in the hotel? Yeah. That's, oh, that's, that's the bottle. Right next to the wine. Well, their water is fine. <laughs> you can drink water anywhere in Israel. The water is pure, clean, just like at home. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's fine. So, yeah, maybe going up to Masada would be one of those places well, you really yeah. want to bring a bottle of water with. So, so yeah, there will be plenty of those options along. Uh, we met, we mentioned, I think, before bringing possibly a small notebook if you want to journal along the way and remind yourself of what you're seeing, or if you just want to, you know, note it down and then add call later. Um, you know, those kind of things would be really good to do. Um, I'm not sure what this says about the Western Wailing Wall. Any questions about the Wailing Wall? Patch ball talk. Head for oh, yes. So, um, yeah, it is going to be very strict for the women there. Um, they, they, like he, the picture you showed, there's a men's section, which is about two thirds of the space, then a much smaller section for the women. Um, you know, but there's, you have to, to go there, you have to wear head covering. And if we go up on the mountain, do we have to wear? No, but you can't have your lace. You have to wear long pants on the top. Okay. All right. So the, so the red hat won't count as an Sure. Yeah. You should have done it. Okay. Yeah. And those are the kind of things that the, the day before we do that, uh, that we can discuss with Yair. And he'll say, this is exactly what you got to do tomorrow. It, it may be you have to have your sleeve covered, your elbows. Your elbows covered, yeah. Um, and one thing I was going to mention when you talked about that, there's a long ramp that gets you up there, and there's usually a line. So it's like being at Disney, you're waiting for the line, and it, that often takes a while. So patience in those kind of settings when we're waiting to get into something, and suddenly there's a long line. Yair does a really good job of saying, well, we're not going at this time because I know everybody will be there then. So we'll just flip the schedule, we'll come back later. So he knows about those, but there's also times it's like, it's just going to be a line. So, so, um, so that's something to be aware of. Um, yeah, if you want to give your family contact numbers um, for our guides, you could do that in case there was an emergency and they wanted to call. They're right at the bottom there, Yair Mazur and Amos. Those are the two owners of the company, the two brothers that own it. Um, uh, Yair is the guide. Amos is kind of the business guy that runs everything. I don't know if Amos will be so much along. We'll see him, but they come along. As, he comes along every so often. Um, and then you have Peter. Um, so if you want to pass on those numbers, you could as well. Um, they really, uh, WhatsApp is something that works great also. If you want to communicate with your family, that's probably the easiest way to do it. If you ever tried the, the app called WhatsApp, it's owned by Microsoft. 
Um, everywhere else but the United States, that's what everybody uses. So when I contact Tanzania, they all use WhatsApp. Or even Messenger. You can, yeah, Messenger. Yeah, they like they like uh, Messenger on Facebook. But WhatsApp is like you can make phone calls, you can text, you can do everything through it. So you can do too, right? What's that? Skype, but they don't have to use that. Yeah, I mean WhatsApp is kind of taken over for Skype. I mean they're both owned by Microsoft. So so do you need um, Wi-Fi to do WhatsApp? Uh you will need a data source. So you'll need to um you'll need to uh either have Wi-Fi or or um a cellular signal. So yeah. So like when we're back in the hotel, you know, uh, you've got Wi-Fi there if you want to make a phone call for that. Um, so yeah. so on the Boeing and the Nervous Because we're going to a hotel in the past, we've shown up at a public beach, which is really unpleasant. And um yeah, because it's probably beach and it's it's crazy. So we will have our own hotel that we go to. We can change in. We'll get our rooms. We're not just gonna go straight to the beach immediately. We'll go to the rooms, change, and then we can go down to the. We might even say, "Hey, anybody that wants to go, we're gonna meet down in the lobby in 15 minutes and head down." You know? And then you bring a change of clothes, or you just go back to the hotel. It would be just like going to a beach. Um, you never want to get in the shower so you can... Yeah, <laughs> it's because it's so salty. You really aren't even supposed to stay in for like longer than I think they stay. You're not really supposed to. It's, it's not like you're going swimming for the whole day. It'll be, it'll be, I think the max is like 30 minutes. Is it's probably well, as much as you want to do. It's, it's pure salt. I mean, it's just like, it's intense. But it's also just an incredible experience. The, the, um, the, the, the underlying, uh, shore, not the shore, but, uh, the bed, the water bed is like, uh, it's almost like a, Play, so it's just this really interesting ground in there. It's actually a little slippery and things like that, but it's it's really an experience. So something to think about. Even if you just come down to it, just see it. You can see people floating. Oh, that's what it looks like. Okay, got it. You know, you don't have to go in if you don't want to. It'll be a beautiful sunny time. Uh, soaking up the sun will be really nice that way. So even if you just want to bring a book down there and sit under. Under an umbrella, I'm making this stuff up. So <laughs> I'm sure they're gonna have umbrellas, right? You gotta have umbrellas. Do you pay for well, we used to? Uh, I'm sure we still do. I don't know what it is though. It was it was I eventually don't Yeah, yeah, I forget. We will I mean the old joke is shopping bathroom, shopping bathroom, shopping bathroom. So that's that's a yeah your joke, you know. That's so we're he's constant he's constantly thinking, okay, we need to happen, you know. So he knows us, you know, so that we'll be thinking about that constantly. Yes. The advantage that we have is that I has done so many trips for Chris and Paul. And and it's just it, it's just like family again. Yeah. You know, it's just it's such a comfort level because he's worked with both of them. And he works with me more than he works with either one of them. I was going to say, <laughs> he's worked with her more. So, yeah, we know. And it's a great, it's a great camaraderie. Yes. Great, you know, it's a friendship. And he's a lot of fun. He's a lot of fun. He's <laughs> incredibly knowledgeable. And, and he's a, he's an archaeologist. I mean, he loves studying. If you want to hear about the, the latest digs and things like that going on. Um, he has a very dry sense of humor. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. So and he gonna... tells the same jokes. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll listen to them again. But... They're fine. Other questions people have seen? Do we need um, any proof of the trip insurance or is that already? I think it'd be good to have. It's kind of like having copies of your passport. Um, all those kind of things are good. When you're suddenly like, oh, I need it now, uh, you know, having a copy along would be good. Now I've tried to collect that from everybody. I've put it up in my air table system so that I can pull it out if I need it. Um, I was gonna say earlier, if you've got your Turkish visa, forward that to me, send me an email with it. I'll load that in there. Um, all those kind of things, I'll keep it so that I've, I've got those. Um, so I think I'm only missing a few documents from a few people. So 
You're one of them. Um, I don't know the travel habits of most of you. I know a lot of you have traveled extensively. I got cold the last time, and I think I know someone else in this room that is probably going to get cold um, because I had my visas and my passport, and I still have them for Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Iran. And Iran was a red flag. And I got cold from the group. The group had to wait for me. They took me to an office, and I was interrogated. So um, if any of you have traveled like that, um, don't be surprised if that happens. They also like to do the thing where they line you up. In a, you're in a big line. They make you almost kind of do a single file. And they'll do the kind of thing like, who's that person over there? Tell me about them. You know, <laughs> they want to know. It's just you know they want to make sure that's their security checks. You know, we had a younger guy with us on one of the trips. And they're like, he doesn't seem to fit in with this group. You know, what, what's what's his story? It's, you know, tough. They'd ask the person at the end of the, the other end of the line. You know, so those kind of the, the standard protocol, very strict security. You know, and uh, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Well, so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, yeah, let me get my directory out. You got to find my directory. Yeah, yeah. And if anybody asks about me, make sure you tell them who I am. We don't know him. Man. He just jumped in the line. Like, he looks kind of sketchy. <laughs> I wouldn't trust him. <laughs> my son got pulled out of the line when we were there last time because he was the only one traveling with this group of old people. Yeah. yeah. Was outside, like bathrooms, everything. They said, was people want to you know. Yeah, that kind of stuff. They're gonna they they're gonna check. It's these random checks. It's it's just random stuff that they're doing to kind of see if they catch anything. So, um, yeah. You use those Apple Air tags with your luggage to track everything. I've got them. Okay. I don't think there'll be a problem. No, but I forgot to put ours. Oh, thank you, Chris. Okay. We've, okay. we've got Air tags for everybody. There you go. I don't, I don't think so. Oh, yeah, 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 luggage tags. Yeah, new color. I would ask, I would ask for the group's indulgence um, when I'm taking photos. So I'm going to take a ton of photos and uh, we'll stop just about everywhere and do a group photo. I, I'm not kidding. So, but you'll love it afterwards. Can't we use the old ones? <laughs> I thought about that, but I'll do it quick. And if we get really used to doing it quick, then it's like done. So, are you setting up the tripod, or are you no. going to run back? Or you I'm not going to be in the photo. Right. Yeah. Although I just ordered a new camera. That's a 360. So. Oh. We're gonna have some fun. You hold it up. You hold it up. No, see, it's the three sixty. You hold it up, and, and it makes it makes the stick disappear. Really cool. It looks it looks almost grownish. Really cool. It's my new toy. So we'll get lots of photos, and I'll give you a link afterwards if you want them. So that'll be fun. You know, I'm just watching. How many is this? Other questions people have about these counting them out. So, so one thing with luggage when when we arrive and we're getting our luggage, always I you know I'm going to help with pulling things out and I'll help with luggage. But always check for your luggage. Don't assume, oh, somebody in the group has it for me. Don't ever assume that. All right. You gotta make sure you've got your stuff. We'll help, you know, and we'll, you know, a bunch of us will probably go ahead and pull things off and put it in a group pile, but always be checking for your luggage. Okay. When we get to the hotel, they'll help out with those kind of things as well. But it's always good to be like, did my luggage make it on the bus? You know, so you, it's good for you to be watching your stuff. Okay. Let's say I used um, bright green gaffing tape all the way around my luggage, little square, so I can see where my luggage is in the big pile. I used to know that it's mine. Yeah. So you want to have little things like that. So you have to look at every single bag. Little, little tricks. Your bag looks like everyone else's. Mine's pink. 
Tips, is everything included for tipping? <laughs> I've been told that everything is included for tips, right, Gail? Hmm? <laughs> tips. You want to answer the tip it's question? It's all included. It's all included. However, Paul said at our meeting yesterday, I'm bringing $50 in singles just in case. And you're going to find situations where somebody does something for you, even though you don't have to tip them, you're going to be like, oh, that was such a nice. Only $20. Only $20. It's just a yeah. So having having a little, but the tips are covered for the hotel um, cleaners, the uh, the bus driver, um, all the standard stuff that you would expect to have to tip for. Now, if you're like that driver was incredible, and I really want to give him an extra ten bucks, have it. You know, we're not going to stop you, but we do want you know. Usually, usually we set it aside in our trip, and usually we'll say. Tips, we usually put about a hundred dollars aside per person for tips. And then we we have done that before. This time the company is handling it and we're like, it's on you. So they are doing everything for us. For lunches, do we tip at lunches in Israel? Um what's it what's true? They're, they're really you mean like at a restaurant? Yeah, there really isn't a tipping policy, I believe. It's not like the US. Everywhere in the world doesn't tip. I mean, we're the ones that try to outdo each other with tips. So but I mean, if you want to tip again and you got great service, it's something like it's up to you. So, more than likely, a lot of our lunch stuff will probably be together. It's not like we're going to send you off into random stuff. And we might say there's three spots right here. Go there. Um, what often happens also, um, this can be a this can be good for us. Uh, is Yair has all these relationships with different stores. So the owner of the store will say, if you bring your group in. You know, I'll give lunch and we'll have, you know, we'll have falafels and fries and we'll have all the and we'll have stuff for them. If they, you know, bring them in, maybe they'll buy from me. You know, that's happened several times. There's a place in Bethlehem where I couldn't get the group out of the store. <laughs> How many of those did you buy? <laughs> Five. Five nativity sets. <laughs> and Dan got to carry them. <laughs> Olive wood gifts are really special. Olive wood gifts, any kind of religious thing, I mean, crosses, lots of stuff that way. Um, in, at the Dead Sea, uh, we will go to uh, a place called Ahava, and it's a high-end um, mineral shop. So you can get the, the creams and the lotions, and you know everybody always raves about them when you get back. So they're great gifts if you know somebody would want that kind of thing. But again, you don't have to. Um, and when we walk the streets of Jerusalem, there's shop after shop after shop. And we'll 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 try to limit that, but um, you know, there's lots of options there. So any other questions? I think we're getting close. So this is the last the last meeting before our, our trip. We're happy to keep answering questions if you want to email us stuff. Um, I will send out um, probably one last email just as a reminder about a bunch of things. If you have your visas, uh, send me a copy of that. I'll put it in your records. Uh, when we do the, I'm guessing we'll get a record of this with the, um, the health form that we'll have to fill out with Israel. We'll probably get some sort of document. Send that to me as well. Um, and I'll keep that all in, in, the, uh, in the system for us. Okay. Shorts. I'm bringing shorts. Yes, I'll familiar. bring shorts. Yeah, <laughs> but it's probably a little bit cooler though. Yeah. So probably pants. And but that's yeah. you know whatever you're comfortable in. I think is okay. is going to be the the thing. Again, when we're in the Dead Sea and when we're down by the Dead Sea, and that's that's hot. I mean, we were there. I think we were there in May or something. We were, and it was it was like 110. Hmm. So it's warm. Yeah. They probably won't be quite that warm, but it'll still be warm. Yeah. Paul, anything else you want to say? Nope. Do we need to stick around for um, Istanbul people to ask answer any questions? Any? How about this? If there's anybody with Istanbul questions, then stick, they can stick around. Or do you have anything you want to say about that? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, do people have a lot of questions about Istanbul? Um, I have two. 
Are the meals included there, or are we on our own terms? Um, it was like uh, you know, the, you're asking me a question. I have to say I am not as prepared as I should be tonight. I have kind of a diversion in my family and did not get as prepared as I thought I would. If I remember um, correctly, it was like the two thirds. Intern, the um, itinerary on the internet should answer that question for you, but I will look it up and I will let you know. Sure. Because I think there was one free day that it was like you're on your own. I think you still got the breakfast meal at I the think hotel. The dinner is the only thing that's included when you're That's the way it feels. Yeah, so off the top of my head. So similar to what it is in Israel, is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to you on that. There's a laundry service. There's laundry services as well if you want to. Um, I would rely on it. Yeah, it won't be free for sure. It won't be free. Your <laughs> room. <laughs> Any other questions people have? It's going to be an awesome trip. Really looking forward to it myself. Um, and uh, again, if you have questions for us, you can always email us or call us. We're happy to answer them. If we don't know the answer, we'll figure it out. So, okay. All right. I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Did everybody get the luggage tags? No, those are open. I didn't get them. No, those are open. Oh, thank you. <laughs> wow. Thank you, everyone. Looking forward to it. Thanks for joining us. Any questions? I should ask uh, the group here. Anybody? Did you guys have any questions? You have to unmute it though. You got your visa? Pull my drive up. Uh, yeah. 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 Can you unmute, Randy? Oh, you got to come down. Yeah, you down. You're still muted. Are you talking to me? There you go. You're talking to me? Talking to Randy. All right, Chris, I'm there. Go ahead. Any questions?